we can prove this theorem now. X is a Banach space, as it always is. P is between one and two. Actually, P can be one, although it makes no difference. The following are equivalent. Uh, one X has real Fourier type P. Two X has torus Fourier type P. And three blah, 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 integers, blah, blah, blah. You already know this theorem. You know the statement anyway. Real Fourier type P, torus Fourier type P, and integer Fourier type P are the same property. So there was no real need to distinguish them. So let's prove it. Let's start by showing that the real Fourier type implies the integer Fourier type. That's just a natural place to start here. So we're assuming that X has real Fourier type P and we wanna show that it has integer Fourier type P. So let's take a function H, which is an LP function on the integers valued in X. And let's take it finitely supported. Because the finitely supported functions are dense in this LP space anyway. So by density, that's okay. And now let's compute the Fourier transform of that H or its norm as a function on the torus LP prime. Well, by definition of what that Fourier transform is, it's the sum over N of the complex exponential E sub N tensored with the vector H of N as a function on the torus. So E sub N here is a function of T. The vectors don't depend on T. And this is exactly the kind of sum that we know how to estimate using this discretization lemma. So we set the function f to be equal to the sum over k in z. Oh, by the way, this is a finite sum. Doesn't look finite, but h is finitely supported. So it's only got finite many terms. We take f to be the sum over all k in the integers of the characteristic function of the interval. Uh, plus k or minus k, yeah. Tensored with the vector h of k. Uh, this maybe I should make it. Let's make this k just for consistency. E sub k, h of k. So this f is the type of function we dealt with in the discretization lemma, but there's no dilation factor involved. It worked for any dilation factor lambda. We take lambda equals one here. We don't need to dilate. And what the discretization lemma tells us, okay, as I said, it's not really a discretization lemma, but it's a convenient name to call it. That lemma tells us that with a constant depending on P, this is actually equivalent to the norm of the Fourier transform of this function F, the real Fourier transform. Is that all clear? That's what we needed that lemma for. We're gonna need it again with actual dilation parameters, but for now we don't need that. Uh, by the way, this lemma doesn't work for p equals one. If you remember, that was for p greater than one and we're saying this for p between one and two, including one. We may as well assume that p is greater than one because for p equals one, the property of Fourier type one is trivial for every group. You don't need to prove anything now. So this lemma works. And now we use the, the real Fourier type that X has. And this is bounded by the LP norm of F as a function on the real line. But when you look at the form that F has, it's got the sequence attached to disjoint sets along the real line. So the LP norm of that function is actually just the little LP norm of these coefficients. And that is of course, the little LP norm of H, which is the right-hand side that we wanted. So this discretization lemma just directly says, right, if you've got real Fourier type P, you can just deduce integer Fourier type P with no issues. So that's 
integer Fourier type from real Fourier type. Next, we'll go back in the other direction. So we're not going to do this technique of proving everything in a circle. We're going to go real equivalent to integer and then move on from there. Integer Fourier type implies real Fourier type. We need to show this estimate here. LP prime norm of the Fourier transform of F is bounded by the LP norm of F. We need to show this for all F in L1 intersect LP. Now by density, we only need to consider F of the following form. F is a sum over K of absolute value less than or equal to N dilation normalized in LP prime by lambda, translate by K, you know what's coming, characteristic function of the unit interval, tensored with XK, <laughs> where the XKs are in X, N is a natural number and lambda is greater than zero because the functions of this form are actually dense in LP. What you've got is basically a compactly supported function, compact support oops, is coming from this restriction on K because you're looking at unit intervals translated around. This dilation factor means that these intervals get shrunk arbitrarily small. So you've got a function which is comp compactly supported and constant on very small intervals. And I would say clearly these functions are dense in LP. You can use Martingale methods to show that. Basically you take lambda to be two to the minus N for some integer N and you're looking at a dyadic filtration on a compact set. So functions of this form are indeed dense in LP. I hope that was a convincing argument. If not, too bad. All right. So it suffices to check functions like this. And then what you know from the discretization lemma is that the LP norm of the Fourier transform of such a function is equivalent to this norm on the torus. like so. And now you use the assumed integer Fourier type because this is a Fourier transform of some function on integers. It's controlled by that. And this is actually the LP norm of F by the same argument that we used before. You've got the disjoint support of all of these coefficients xk on some small interval. You ignore the dilation because it doesn't change the LP prime. Hang on, should that be LP norm or LP prime norm? That should be an LP norm. Yep. So the dilations don't matter and you're looking just at coefficients attached to unit intervals translated so they're disjoint. So the LP norm is just the, the LP sum of those coefficients. And that says that x has real Fourier type P, which is what needed to be shown. So you just prove it on this dense subclass. I only just noticed there was some stuff going on in the chat, but I don't have to address this, do I? My YouTube channel's got that seminar talk. Good. <coughs> so at this point, we've shown that real Fourier type and integer Fourier type are equivalent. Now we need to handle the torus. Let's go from the integers to the torus. We're supposing that X has integer Fourier type P. And okay, so let's say, okay, well, this implies that X has real Fourier type P by what we just proved. That implies that the dual of X has real Fourier type P because we showed that real Fourier type is stable under the dual. And that then implies that X dual has integer Fourier type P. So we get the duality result for integer Fourier type from the real one, once we've proven the equivalence of these two things. We're gonna use that. It's a nice little argument. Let's consider a trigonometric polynomial G of degree less than or equal to N 
and this will be an LP on the torus valued in X. By density, these are the only functions we need to consider on the torus. Trigonometric polynomials are dense in LP. We said that last week or the week before, week before. And what we need to do is to estimate the, the norm of the Fourier transform of G in little LP prime. Oops, it's not on the torus, that's on the integers. And we're going to do that by duality. So we need to take a, a sequence, a finitely supported sequence in the dual space. Oops, running out of space. Oh, no, my eraser is not working. Okay, in X star. And what we need to look at is the size of this sum here, XK acted on by XK star. Yeah, let me write it out a bit more explicitly. This X sub K is actually, okay, my race has decided not to work on me. Note that the Fourier coefficients of this function G are actually just the vectors X sub K. G is a trigonometric polynomial. That's how Fourier coefficients work for trigonometric polynomials. So what we need to estimate is this. Our duality. And the trick is to write this out as an integral over the torus of these functions here. Okay, Zoom says I've been signed out. This is the standard bug that always happens when Christoph tries to log into his account, but I'm still here it seems. We take this function here. So in each of these two factors, we put a trigonometric polynomial. So we sum over K and J, and we put some nice complementary trigonometric polynomials in there. Complex exponentials, I should, should, should say, not trigonometric polynomials. This is the this independence trick that we've done a couple of times before with Rademacher variables. If you expand out this sum, you get some terms that's the integral of ek against ej, and that will vanish unless k equals j. So this we can estimate by LP norms on the torus. So this one we take LP. And for this one, Oops, I don't want T's here. I want functions. And that should be an X dual. <coughs> now remember, we're assuming integer Fourier type. So we can estimate norms on the torus if they're norms of Fourier transforms. In particular, this one here, it's an LP prime number on the torus. We can actually estimate that by a little LP norm of a sequence. So using that X star has integer Fourier type P. This first term is unchanged. And the second term is the little LP norm of a sequence, the sequence xj star, that. Now, what am I missing here? Anything? This function here, this is g. <laughs> so we can just write this as the LP norm of g. Oops. like that. So what this is showing by the duality argument is that the norm of the Fourier transform of G in little LP prime is controlled by the norm of G 
in LP. That should be the integers. This is, yep, okay. Like that. All right. That was a bit confusing, I realize, but I hope it made some sense. Is anybody confused by that? I feel like I'm a bit confused by that proof. We're estimating this little LP prime norm here. We test against a little LP sequence, X star. We get the little LP norm here, so we can ignore that. And yeah, everything works. So that was showing that integer Fourier type implies, wait, torus Fourier type. It makes sense to confuse the integers and the torus. They're dual to each other. They're kind of the same group in a sense. Anyway, the remaining thing to prove is that torus Fourier type implies integer Fourier type, and it's basically the same duality argument. So I won't do the details. I'll say similar. And then you're done. Because real and integer Fourier type are equivalent and integer and torus Fourier type are equivalent. So all three are equivalent. I'll write that proof in a bit more detail when I actually write out the tech notes. So you can have a second look at that. But it's that's the basic idea. You can introduce these complex exponentials using this independence type argument. That sort of thing doesn't work on the real line, but on the torus it does because you just have this countable sum of trigonometric polynomials rather than an integral. The integral wouldn't quite work. Okay, so now we know that real and integer and torus Fourier type are equivalent. That's good to know. We're going to use that again on Thursday, but for now that's the goal done. And I should just mention that we did everything in one dimension, but you can do all of this in arbitrarily many dimensions. You can work with RD or TD or ZD, and these three properties will be equivalent. And then you can also show that the properties are independent of the dimension as well. So if you have this property for one dimension D, you have it for all dimensions as long as it's finite anyway. So we're going to move on to something else. Are there any questions about that before we do that? Good, okay. So the last thing we'll do is talk about Fourier type real or integer. Well, just I'll say Fourier type now to mean real Fourier type, which is the same as torus or integer. Fourier type in the connection with Rademacher type, because we have this other type and cotype lying around, Rademacher type and cotype. And how do these things relate to each other? Because it turns out they do. So just to recall what that was, X has Rademacher type P, oh, also cotype Q, I'll say that after run, later on. Sometimes you say type instead of writer marker type. If someone talks to you about type without clarifying what it is, it's writer marker type. It's the most common type. I always say Fourier type to mean Fourier type, but I'll just say type to mean writer marker type. So X has writer marker type P. P is between one and two. If the, let me write it out properly. For all integers N, for all sequences X bullet, which is, X sub n, n from one to n, n from one to capital N in X, you have that the Rademacher norm of that sequence, which by definition is the expectation of this Rademacher sum. So we have Rademacher variables epsilon sub n. I defined it to be the L2 average, but as you know by Kahan Kinchin, you can replace two with any P and it doesn't make a difference. Rademacher type P says that this quantity is controlled by the little LP norm of the sequence of vectors. So this is X bullet little LP n valued in X. That's Rademacher type P. And Rademacher cotype Q between two and infinity is the reverse estimate. It says that the little LQ norm of that sequence is bounded by the Rademacher norm. 
We didn't use type and cotype very much, but we introduced it briefly at one point. People remember that vaguely. Yeah. These type and cotype properties are pretty important in geometry of Banach spaces. They have a lot of other interpretations other than just estimates for Rademacher norms. But in applications, they're quite useful, as is Fourier type. And you want to know, okay, does Fourier type imply Rademacher type? Does Rademacher type imply Fourier type? Are they really the same thing in disguise? They're not the same thing in disguise, but there are implications. The only proposition that we'll use, if X is a Banach space, P is between one and two. If X has Fourier type P, meaning real or torus or integer Fourier type, then X has Rademacher type P and cotype P prime. The converse isn't true, but this one direction is true. And how do we prove this? This is actually a similar proof to the last one we just did on the on the torus where we introduce some variables and use the independence. Is it? Wait, no, it's not. Okay, sorry, it's not that proof. I confused myself. It's a different proof. We assume P is greater than one or otherwise there's nothing to show because type one and cotype infinity hold for every Banach space. So we're assuming X has Fourier type P. So X has in particular integer Fourier type P. And that's the one we're gonna use. I won't say sorry yet, I need to set up a little bit more. My tablet is really not agreeing with me today. I'm supposed to have the eraser, okay. I won't erase anything. X has Z Fourier type P. Fix a sequence, x sub n, n from one to capital N in x, and we need to show this estimate for Rademacher norms. We would need to estimate this guy here. So we'll use Kahan Kinchin. So that we can say, okay, this Rademacher norm can be seen as an LP prime average. We're going to pick P prime. So we write out what this is. We have some probability space lying around where all the Rademacher averages live. That's what omega is. And what we do is we introduce an integral on the torus just completely for free. We take this Rademacher variable and then we put in a complex exponential e to the minus n of t. And then we put in the complex exponential e to the n of t, just so that we're multiplying by one, so that that can be put in for free. d omega dt. That's p prime, but yep, is there room for that? All right. And now what we notice is that we can take out one of these complex exponentials using the contraction principle. Absolute value of this is one. So for each, that's right. Absolute value e to the minus nt is equal to one for all t in the torus. So we fix a t and then we use the contraction principle in omega. And the result of that is that up to a constant that doesn't matter, we have the Rademacher average with just one of these complex exponentials. Anyone confused about that? We have this contraction principle for Rademacher sums. It says if you've got some coefficients that have absolute value one, you can pull them out up to the price of some constant out the front. Now we use Fabini because you always use Fabini. Integral over omega, and now we have an LP prime norm on the torus. 
with some complex exponentials. So the P prime, integral over omega. And what can we do with this? We have integer Fourier time. Again, this is a, a norm of a trigonometric polynomial. You can see that there's a Fourier transform of some sequence. So we use the integer Fourier type P of X and you bound this by the norm of the sequence. So you have epsilon n omega xn to the p, p prime on p. This is using the, the Fourier type p. So this, you start with the sequence in little lp, hit it with the Fourier transform, you get a function on, on the torus in lp prime. That's the bound you get. You notice that these Rademacher variables don't affect that norm at all. So you ignore them, pull them out, and then you see that the resulting sum here is omega independent. So when you integrate that over the probability space, nothing happens. And you end up with just the little LP norm of that sequence. And that's the right-hand side you wanted to show that X has got Rademacher type P. As you wanted to show. The last thing is we want to show that X also has Rademacher cotype P prime because we wanted to show type P and cotype P prime and type P does not imply cotype P prime. So to show that X as Rademacher co-type P prime. We use that X has torus Fourier type P. So when we show type P, we use that X has integer Fourier type P. And when we're showing co-type P prime, we're gonna use that X has torus Fourier type P because it's equivalent. So with the sequence from before, we need to estimate this LP norm of the sequence, not LP prime norm of the sequence. And straight away, we use the integer, not integer Fourier type, we use the torus Fourier type and say that this is bounded by the LP norm of this trigonometric polynomial. Because that's what torus Fourier type tells you. then you do the same argument from before, but in reverse. So now we write that as an integral over the torus and add in a probability space. We have our trigonometric polynomial. We have a Rademacher variable and we square that Rademacher variable so that it's equal to one because Rademacher variables are plus minus one value. Do you square it? It's a constant one. Smuggle in a Rademacher variable for free. And exactly as before, you use the contraction principle to get rid of one of them. So now we just have one Rademacher variable. And yeah, use Kahan Kinchin. You can even get rid of the treatment. Hang on, I've got to get rid of more than that. I'm going to get rid of one of the Rademacher variables and also the complex exponentials because they've got modulus one. So by the contraction principle, you can also get rid of that. And this is just the Rademacher norm up to a constant. There you go, that's cotine P prime. Makes sense. All good. Cool. So what did we just prove? If X has got Fourier type P, then X has Rademacher type P and cotype P prime. So as a quick corollary of that, which is what Thursday is going to be about. If X has Fourier type two, 
which means if you have Poincaré's theorem, X has Poincaré's theorem. then X has type two and co-type two, Rademacher type and co-type. So what we're gonna show on Thursday is if, if X has Rademacher type two and co-type two, then X is isomorphic to a Hilbert space. And this is gonna be Kwapien's theorem. Basically, if X has Poincaré's theorem, then X is isomorphic to a Hilbert space. The converse of the first thing we said in this lecture, if X is isomorphic to a Hilbert space and Poincaré's theorem holds, you have Fourier time two. Now that was all I had prepared for today. I do have 15 minutes left and I do have Thursday's lecture written up. So maybe I can quickly start on that. Let me just see what can we do with that. Let me introduce a concept that we're not going to prove anything about. It'll just be useful to have this in our bag on Thursday and not have to talk about it then. And actually, since we were just talking about Rademacher sums, it's a natural time to talk about this thing. Just briefly, any questions before we move on? No. Sorry, my pages are all over the place. I ran out of staples, so my notes are not stapled together anymore and they just keep flying everywhere. It's a bit of a problem. What I want to talk about finally is the Gaussian analog of Rademacher sums because we've been doing Rademacher sums quite a bit. And one thing we haven't done, which is important, is Gaussian sums. So we've got these Rademacher averages that we dealt with all the time, which is where you take a sum with some Rademacher variables and you take an expectation of that. Rademacher variables. So just remember, Rademacher variables have, well, have values plus or minus one with equal probability. That's the definition of a Rademacher variable. And we have a Rademacher sequence here. So we have a bunch of independent Rademacher variables that we use in forming this sum. A Gaussian sum or a Gaussian average, I should say. It's where you take the expectation of a sum where instead of putting Rademacher variables, you put some Gaussian random variables. IID, so independent, identically distributed Gaussian variables, standard normals, actually, let's say, not just Gaussian, but standard, standard Gaussians, standard normal, that's a probable, let's say, IID. Real or complex standard normal variables. There are complex standard normal variables, complex valued. To be honest, I can't remember the definition. I have to get it for Thursday. They look like Gaussians, but they have complex values instead of real. And you can formulate random sums in Banach spaces with these random variables instead of plus minus one. So instead of randomly assigning a sign, you actually randomly assign a constant out the front. And Gaussian variables can be arbitrarily large. These are not bounded random variables. So you can have arbitrarily large constants out the front of each of the terms of this sum. And it turns out these Gaussian averages appear quite naturally because Gaussian random variables have this orthogonal invariance properties. They respect the geometry of Euclidean space quite well. Turns out the random variables are useful in random sums. And you have two theorems that are useful. We're not gonna prove either of them. I'm just gonna state them because it takes too long to prove these. This first one is not obvious at all. Suppose X is a Banach space with finite cotype. Finite Rademacher cotype. So suppose that X has cotype Q for some Q less than infinity. Then basically Rademacher averages are equivalent to Gaussian averages. So what this says is that whenever you have a Rademacher average and you measure that in LP, P 
is between one and infinity, not including infinity. If X has finite cotype, then this is equivalent to the corresponding Gaussian average. The proof is quite non-trivial. One direction is actually easy. I forget which one. And the other one is hard. The direction of this equivalence. I mean, you always have the one of these is less than or equal to the other, but I can't remember which one it is. So that's one thing we'll use on Thursday, the equivalence of Rada marker and Gaussian averages. We're going to be using it on spaces with type and cotype too. So we certainly have finite cotype. The other theorem we'll use, which is really the reason that we're bringing in Gaussian averages, is this property called covariance domination. For Gaussian averages, which says, suppose that the vectors x dot satisfy this property. Right. Suppose you have two sequences, x dot, y dot. These are sequences in x. And suppose that they satisfy this property here. That I'll write out and then explain. Suppose that when you test the sequences against an element of the dual space and you sum them up in this L2 way, suppose that you have this control of X by Y, Xn by Yn. Then for all P between one and infinity, not including infinity, you actually have a control of one Gaussian sum by another one in LP less than or equal to, no constant here. So this covariance domination gives you a, a deterministic condition that will guarantee that one Gaussian sum is controlled by the other. This is a very useful theorem. It implies the corresponding domination for Rademacher averages as well, if you have the equivalence of Rademacher and Gaussian averages. Because of course, if you have this Gaussian average controlled by that one, and if Gaussian averages are equivalent to Rademacher averages, then one is dominated by the other with a constant. But there are Banach spaces for which you don't have the equivalence of Rademacher and Gaussian sums. And this covariance domination still holds in those spaces, but only for Gaussian sums. So this is why Gaussian sums are useful. And particularly if they're equivalent to Rademacher sums. We're not going to do anything with that today because the lecture's finished, but on Thursday, we're going to use these when we prove that Rademacher type two and co-type two imply that the Barnack space is isomorphic to a Hilbert space. I hope that wasn't too quick. I hope that made some sense. That should be all. Any questions? No. So yeah, Thursday's the last lecture. It's a bit sad, but you know, things have to end. Any requests for stuff to discuss on Thursday, by the way? Because I figured there'd be maybe half an hour at the end of Thursday where we can just discuss stuff from the course. If you want me to talk about any particular thing that I have to prepare for, let me know now. Otherwise, you have to ask me on the spot and I might not know your answer. Cool. If there are no questions, I'll see you Thursday.